Uh, I'm Dave Shulman, one of the chess presidents, and uh, this is a, a session where we're going to talk to some chess leadership and get to know people a little bit better. We're here with Dr. Lisa Moores. Lisa, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dave. So uh, why don't we start with letting everybody out there in the real world uh, know a little bit about yourself. How long do you have? I got a while. <laughs> they may not, I but I've got, you'd say that. I've got plenty of time. What, what do you want to know? Um, I, I'm currently uh, the Associate Dean for Assessment at America's Medical School, we like to say, the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. Um, I spent 30 years as an Army physician, pulmonary critical care. Um, I trained at the old Walter Reed back before we merged with Navy to create Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. So i kind of glad I got through there when it was still Walter Reed Army beat Navy. Uh, but, you know, I went to medical school at the Uniformed Services, so I really enjoy being back working at the school that, uh, that gave me my degree. And as you and I have talked and kind of joked around a little bit too, I'm pretty proud of my undergrad and I, I got my <laughs> undergrad degree at the Ohio State University. Which you didn't include. Go Bucks. You didn't include the the, the first time not, we had the conversation. But you know, the, the, the audience needs to, they won't know what I'm talking about. Without the leading article. Go Bucks. Um, now, you and I serve on the board together currently, yes. um, but you've had a number of other leadership roles at CHEST. I I, it's not your tendency to brag about yourself, but I'm going to give you free reign to do so. Can you give us a sense of that sort of breadth of activity that you've participated, uh, in which you participated at CHEST? I'd say um, almost every committee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like to be a worker bee. Um, I love this organization. Really, really love it. It's been my professional home. I feel genuinely like my promotion through academic medicine was was only possible because of CHEST and because of the things that I was able to do with CHEST, but also the relationships I built here, the, the mentors, the sponsorship, being able to get people to help me with my promotion, to show me how to get there, because the military can be a very insular, group and it's you don't have a lot of that outside perspective to tell you what you need to do and yet although we're a military medical school they do expect that sort of broad look to get promoted so um, I started very early on I think my my introduction was as a fellow when I would come to the annual meeting I always wanted to get a case report accepted for the affiliates competition as we called it back then um, and that was so much fun being able to meet the experts that they would bring in to listen to our case reports and were so welcoming and so approachable you know as a fellow just having you know these giants in chess medicine treating me like I was royalty which is only funny because I sort of felt that way about you I had quizzed you a little earlier or sort of warned you I was going to ask this if you remember the first time we met because I, I know I remember it quite vividly because you I perceived you like you have now referenced some of these other sort of giants of chest medicine so I won't put you on the spot it was uh, early 2000s I was okay. right out of fellowship or relatively relatively proximately out of fellowship it was one of the postgraduate courses that chest used to do and they recently started doing it on leadership development and you were one of a modest number of speakers. Uh, you were there in your sort of military dress, <laughs> blues or gray, I, I, blue dress or gray, blues. I don't know what it was. Um, but you spoke very passionately about your sort of, again, you were, we were all a little younger back then. And but I you was were, still very junior faculty. Right. But I recall very vividly that I knew your name because, you know, maybe you're not as famous then as you are now, but you were still fairly well known for relatively junior faculty. And I remember thinking how approachable you were. And I felt the same way about other speakers. That I remember Nancy Collin. That was the mm -hmm. first time I met Nancy was at that leadership Nancy development session. Nancy was someone session. that did that for me. Um, so I, I could not agree more with what you've said about chess being an opportunity to meet people. I've always found it a very personal society, very, almost everybody's quite approachable. Yes. And I think we're very supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. Um, of late, you've started to get your fingers a little bit more into this guidelines piece, mm -hmm. and I want to spend some time. So you've al you've always been very involved in guidelines. Thrombotics, I think, is sort of your uh, anti. I guess the the, 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 the fight against yeah the yes. fight against thrombosis. Uh -huh. um, but what is your current role on, on the guidelines oversight committee? Uh, I am currently the vice chair of the guidelines oversight committee. I will be taking over as chair in January when we go through our 
leadership cycle change. Um, I, I would say that I was interested in the guidelines from the beginning just because CHEST was the guideline for antithrombotics. And my area of expertise, my area of interest, my research was all in venous thromboembolism. And it was really cool to see that internationally the guideline that everybody went to was CHESS guideline. And there were others out there and that there still are. But I think we have, we have the marquee one in thrombosis and I've always been really proud of it. I wasn't really involved in it until we did the, I want to think, I, I say the ninth edition, so back in 2012, and I talk about imposter syndrome. I mean, I was the least experienced person on that panel, and I ended up on a chapter that I was not an expert in. It was on the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and I was like, I don't know anything about this other than obviously managing it. Right. Uh, but I was there because of that. I didn't have any conflicts in that area, and they needed an, a non, you know, an unconflicted panelist on that. Um, but that was that was my foot in the door. And fast forward a couple years, we didn't like the way that process went in terms of um, it was led a little bit too heavily by methodologists, and we wanted to make a change. And the current chess leadership, and and I think. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was Darcy at the time, who was either president. Darcy being Darcy Marcinic. Darcy Marcinic, well, former one of chess our president, master fellows. Um, he it was either president or was going to be, and he sat with me with the current chair of the GOC and said, "We'd like you to take over the antithrombotics." And I, I remember looking around the room like, "Where's the camera? <laughs> this is the biggest. This has got to be." You did not um, feel ready for. Oh, it's not ready, but it got handed to me as we were trying to move into sort of a new living guidelines model. So, and I think once I saw how that process worked, then I wanted to be part of the committee to help shape the next steps. So you mentioned <coughs> opening the door. So this is a good chance to sort of uh, transition into this sort of wooden this, structure. This but door have you seen, that's in front of me? Well, no, I just, it's an opportunity to sort of start something while okay. we're talking about starting right. something. So, uh, you know, as part of this series, we're gonna be sort of just doing things while we're talking. Uh, people found out I have not played Jenga before. <laughs> they know I'm not particularly physically adept, so they said this is a great way for Dave to make a fool of himself and he has no qualms. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and open the door. I understand that you've played this game before. I, I have, right, but so, not, I'm, so not, I'm not great at it take, either. Take it easy on me. So what we'll do is I'll ask a question, move a piece, and then after you respond, you can move a piece and so on. Okay. You mentioned opening the door, mm -hmm. getting in the door. I think that's something that a lot of folks who are a little bit more junior at chess, either fellows or junior faculty, want to know a little bit more about because guidelines as you nicely said are something we're particularly well known for talk to us a little bit about the guidelines process in just a minute or so like what does it take to like get a guideline proposed how do we decide what guidelines we're going to do and what's that process of kind of uh, moving them through the through the process from getting uh, proposed to approved to actually getting published and i'm going to do a piece of this while we're talking I can mess with piece. you while you try to do a piece and like, make sure you're not I think you have to test, right? You're supposed to test and see well, which yeah, ones are movable. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but if you move a bunch... Oh, I, I got one. Okay, okay. Now, that one's moving. All right. Okay. So now, now you have to answer. All right. So that, that process has evolved over the years as well. And we put a new one in place recently that I think brings in all the best practices we've had in the past. So it's not that it's that much different. We have several what we would call our key portfolios. Um, that we really want to make sure we maintain. Antithrombotics portfolio being one of them, lung cancer guidelines, uh, our cough guidelines have always been another really key set of guidelines for the organization. We feel that because at times the resources have been constrained that we've ended up that sometimes those are our, our only guidelines are in those areas and we really wanted to diversify the portfolio to represent all the areas that CHEST members are, you know, interested in, involved in, and, and to more closely parallel our curricular pillars and the pillars that the journal have. So we are branching out into, you know, ILD, airways disorders, critical care, sleep. Uh, th These are things currently in the workings? That, that, we're, that we are, have added to the portfolio and are, in, are now in the works, and we're doing it through two processes. One is through what we're calling sort of an RFP. Um, that we put out to the networks saying please give us topic proposals within this pillar and then those are really easy to do um, anyone that's involved with the network can can get 
either whether they're on their steering committee or they can talk to the steering committee and it's really a two-page process saying this is what well, this is my idea what this is the gap this is why I think we need a guideline in this area not a ton of work those initial two pagers get reviewed and then several are asked to submit a full a little bit more fleshed out proposal who would the ch you know the, pa uh, the chairs be that could be the person proposing it who would be on the panel um, and and with some guidance from the committee on how to f how to create a panel what kind of diversity we need there what the questions would be what clinical questions are you answering a and eventually we will pick one of those in each area for each year but in in terms of getting involved it would be they can propose one of these um, they can work within their networks to say if we have a topic accepted I would like to be one of the panel members so learning how to be on the panel I think those would be some easy first steps to get involved they could also try to you know be involved with the guidelines oversight committee itself when there are openings through the regular nomination process because many of our GOC members don't necessarily have experience <coughs> on a panel yet Th that's not a prerequisite so I want to jump down it's your turn to actually go I think you've All been right. delaying because you didn't know what piece you wanted to but I don't blame <laughs> you because it is a complex game um, so while you're you're identifying and I'm gonna watch your strategy here oh I see you just found an easy one um, so the first process you said is identify a potential clinical gap where there isn't a lot of evidence, but something that has a clinical conundrum or some um, uh, uncertainty in terms of optimal practice, and write up this sort of two-page proposal working through the network model, meaning touching base with a steering committee chair in that space, steering committee members in that space, and the two-pager is not not no. a huge amount of work, no. it sounds like. Um, and I, I can't... So I, I love that idea because the best way to get involved is to actually put something forward. Mm -hmm. The number of people who don't, you and I talked a little bit, put up their hand Reason and say, I want to try this. It, there is a little bit of activation energy required to, yep. to put that two-page proposal, but it's not a 25-page grant proposal. Right. Um, and so that's something that would then get reviewed by GOC, potentially approve, ask for more information and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to me about the other piece. because. Uh, about the GOC itself. So how big is it? And, and if somebody wanted to run for a position, what is the ideal candidate? I mean, there probably isn't one ideal candidate, but what is the diversity of candidates for which you're looking to sit on the GOC? What, like, what are the key criteria? How do they get to know you? How do they build that skill set that you might be looking for? It's a great question, Dave, and one that we've sort of grappled with within the committee. We've sort of gone back and forth quite a bit do are we looking for people with expertise in certain clinical areas so as i was mentioning we're diversifying the portfolio do we need members of the oversight committee that represent those different areas do we need someone who focuses mainly on sleep medicine do we need someone who is focusing on interstitial lung disease because they would potentially serve as liaisons to those guideline um, working groups and panels as they develop the guideline or do we want people that really, independent of their content expertise, understand the approach to evidence-based medicine, have some interest in doing systematic reviews, meta-analyses, have maybe have done some of them in the past as part of their research, as part of their you know, work in whatever area that they're, they're doing, again, even if it's in a different area of, of content than perhaps one of the guidelines that's being started. And it, we're really settling on a mixture of both. They don't have to have the expertise in methodology. They don't. If they're, you know, if they're aggressive, they dynamic, have the energy and potentially the time. Like right. That's the hard part. Right. And they want to help us really keep the chess standard alive. We, we feel we have very high standards in our guidelines. And we're very conscious of conflict of interest and making sure that the questions are developed appropriately. And to the best of our ability, making recommendations that are actually you're able to implement. They're not. There are going to be times where it it just is gray, and it, there's shared decision making with the patient, and there's no way around that. But then trying to give as much context to the practitioner in how they use that information to talk to the patient, but wherever possible, making it fairly clear that actually this this is really the way you should go if there's no reason not to and making that easy. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's that combination of do you, 
are you really interested? Are you? I considered myself for the, sort of an evidence-based geek, regardless of area, and that was what got me interested in guidelines. Also, we, we have people like that, and we have people that just want to serve chest and have an area of interest that aligns with some of our guidelines. All right, so All right, two ways. What I'm hearing is then, oh, see, I like I like how you're verbally planning. <laughs> You're talking yourself through, like, what's the right piece? Yes. So it sounds like two ways, really two ways that to potentially enter this this arena. One is if you're having, if you've identified an area of clinical interest where there's a little equipoise in a, in a piece, you can write a two-page proposal with the assistance of your uh, steering committee. Uh, alternatively, the GOC, there are members of the GOC presumably on these writing committees, but the GOC predominantly is overseeing the choice of right. which the, ones we're writing. So GOC two ways to get involved. Really oversees them. Okay. It, um, we, as I, as I sort of mentioned, we do have a liaison to each guideline panel, each guideline that's under development. It's up to that GOC member as to what level they want to, to get involved. If they have a real interest in that area and they want to be a full-fledged panel member in such that they would be part of the writing and be, you know, somewhere in that authorship line, they can do that. If they want to take sort of a, I'm just going to ensure that you're following chest policy, they could do that and, and they might be acknowledged but not be an author and then there's something in between. So, so they have that opportunity to, to be involved at whatever level they would feel comfortable with. We are also telling GOC members that when we do get some that are just really interested and want to maybe someday be able to be the person, the methodologist for a guideline, that we would give them the training and, and, and the experience to do that. And that's so that we expand that pool. Yeah, and that's something very cool. I know that we offered a course uh, last year, two years ago, in the methodology piece. And, and it wasn't incredibly well subscribed, but I think those who did subscribe to it felt like they got a ton out of yeah. it. All right, I'm gonna ask you one more question in this space, okay. then we're gonna go to a speed round. This is not about GOC, but about a variety of other okay. things. And I'm uh -oh. sure you're super, super excited about that. All right, so if, uh, I don't wanna distract, well actually I totally do wanna distract yes, you while you're do. doing this. Yeah, why would I say I didn't wanna distract? That's exactly what I intend to do. <laughs> so if somebody wants to learn more, do, are there GOC meetings that people can attend? Are there individuals to whom they can reach out to just, you know, even by email, to get some more information, information on the website, anything like that? Well, as we've talked about, I don't know that there's a single leader at Chess that isn't approachable, yeah. uh, and we have all of all of our members on the site. They can reach out to me at any time. Our outgoing chair is uh, Kevin O'Neill, who would be happy to talk to anybody. We have a new um, director of guidelines of guideline development at Chess, uh, Dr. John Iacarino. John is fantastic. He's currently at BU, uh, but also now working for Chess. John would be happy to talk to anybody. Great. Um, you know, our staff members, so Leanne Fulton or Emmy, Emily Petraglia, any of us. Emily does everything, as you yes. know. Yes, <laughs> and they certainly could then reach out to any members of the G current members of the GOC. Um, uh, Dr. Angel Coz is actually on the GOC, but also the chair of the Council of Networks. So the folks that are in the networks could reach out to Angel to get a sense for what it's like to be on the GOC. So it sounds like the biggest gap is just that first step mm -hmm. of reaching out. And again, because there is activation energy, there's this perception that like, oh, they're not looking for someone like me. I think every, a lot of people feel that way. And as a result, we probably don't get the breadth of applications, proposals that we potentially could given the breadth of our membership. Yeah, yeah I think you, you and I have talked about this. I, sometimes I feel a little guilty. I really think that when I was at that junior level like you, just coming out of fellowship. The affiliate committee was somewhat, it wasn't. The, now it's called the TNT. Now right? it's called yeah. the Training and Transitions yeah. Committee. And, and it was the affiliate committee, then it became a network, and then it went to TNT. But it was, I don't think quite as competitive. And because I had been involved as a fellow in the process, that there was that opportunity to, to be on the affiliate committee. I don't think that there, there are openings quite as often anymore that are easy, and I don't want young members to get discouraged when they put in an application and they're not selected. We sometimes, I remember on the Education Committee, but now on GOC, we will have 10 to 12 or more sometimes applications for one opening. Right. 
So I would really encourage them to, to also look at the work groups for all of these committees because that's a great way to think about, as we talked about earlier, being on one of the guideline panels. Because certainly once you've been involved in the development of one of our guidelines from start to finish, that's an incredible experience and you know wealth of knowledge that the GOC would look upon very favorably when there are openings. And it's sort of building that resume so that when there are 10 to 12 to 1, you are, you are the one. Um, yeah. I, I still firmly believe, though, that if you just keep raising your hand and saying, I want to be involved I, will, uh, involved, I will help, tell me, even if it's just helping you behind the scenes with some of the People crossfire. remember that. Yes. People remember that. Yes. And it does. It was a wonderful, it is your turn. I notice you're avoiding going, and I don't blame you because it is getting progressively harder it to is. find a piece that's safe to move. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I can't, I think John Hunting Hockey um, did a great session, one of the junior faculty getting more involved in chess. It wasn't that long ago, he was a senior fellow, did a great session last year on failure. And I think the problem is people look at you, maybe they look at me, although I don't feel it, and they look at their CVs and they're like, wow, this person's never failed at anything. But I've the story I often, plenty. yeah, the story I often share is it took me eight tries to get on the education committee. <laughs> And the, at the, for my first leadership position at Chest was on Sleep Network, but I was an afterthought. They had like rejected me, and then I guess later on a position opened up. They're like, "Well, this guy's still available. <laughs> let's get him. Let's draft him from the minor going leagues." Going down, but I moved it enough by the rules that I have to. Well, stay I'm with not going to distract. I don't even see. I didn't even know there were rules, so you could have just slid mm -hmm. it back, and I would not have known you. One thing I won't do to you is cheat. I, 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 but I wouldn't know. That's the beauty of it. All right. Well, if this I piece, would. <laughs> Integrity. Well, that's see, and America's medical school is <laughs> proud of its graduate, Dr. Lisa Morris. Yeah. All right. So as we now move into the speed round, we're going to have to pick up the pace. I'm likely to lose here, but we're going to ask <laughs> the other just a couple of questions, no more than thirty seconds per answer. All right. I'll try. Uh, favorite flavor of ice cream and why? Peppermint patty. From that's, a, that's a flavor from Friendlies. Okay. Oh, it's either peppermint patty or peppermint stick. It's been so long. I was a kid. They only brought it out during the holidays. And so I had a favorite of theirs, but it was available all year round. And Peppermint Stick was only, you know, November through early January. And it had little crunchy pieces yeah, of I peppermint think I've, in it. I think a Friendly is a regional place, but it's, yeah, I think it's, it's going under now. I feel I like think it's, it's not gone. available anymore. All right. You can get their ice cream in the grocery store. All right, so while I'm posing the next question, it's your turn. I'm surprised I survived that one. What is the movie that when you're uh, browsing the TV channels and you see it, you're like, I know I've seen this a dozen times before, but I got to hang out Sweet here for Home a Alabama. Minutes. Now that's not what something I would have guessed. Why? Is, oh. What's oh, the? Oh, such a great movie. This is uh, with Reese Witherspoon, right? Where she's kind of going back to her. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can give you so many lines from that. Movie. I trust that you can, and um, I'm not sure either me or the audience really wants. I don't know. Right? It's just it's just a feel good story. It um, it's it's got some like I said some amazing lines. Uh, I'm a romantic at heart. It's probably one of the few chick flicks my husband will watch with me more Ooh. than once. Oh, I'll have to mention so, that to him next time I see yes. him. Oh, yeah. He's probably seen it ten, at least ten times. By choice or because he's no, a good because husband? because I put it on. Okay, he's a good husband. But he'll That's tell good. you it has great, great lines in it. He, he likes it, too. Okay. And we will occasionally... There's one we love to say, and you'll, you'll have to watch the movie to see it, but we'll sort of look at each other and go, it doesn't look like it. So... I will, oh. I've not seen it, but now just, when, just I, when I do, I'll, I won't you, Google it. I'll actually watch it. You'll see it. All right, so it's, it is your turn. I'm going to pose the next. I, see, I like how you're, you are so good at delaying. Like, I don't want to move, Strategy. so let's just answer this question. Strategy. You know, is that what it is? Yes. I've just figured delay tactics. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, we'll do two more because I think by then the tower will have fallen and that will call it into the interview. Um, you know, I don't know. I think he's played this before. I really have not. Come on, where is I think you've <laughs> really played this not. before. I really have not. TV show binging. Are you like? Do you do the Netflix or Hulu and just binge a season of something? I don't. Well, I wouldn't call myself a binger, but because I also I just don't watch TV real time. So when I hear of a good show that people talk about over and over and over again, then I will, and I kind of like that because by the time I hear about it, there's two or three seasons, and I don't like being left hanging. So. But I won't watch the whole thing in a day or two. I'll watch two or three episodes, and you know, then so the next the, time. I what sit was down. the most recent one that met those um, criteria? This is us. 
Really? That's that's actually still on. It's on it like is. NBC, so now I, I don't like it because now I'm caught up. Yeah, that's the worst. And, uh, yeah, that's the worst. <laughs> We've gotten um, so spoiled. Remember when that didn't exist and we had yeah. to wait every week? As a now family, we're so spoiled. we binged, um, with, when the kids were a little bit younger, high school age, we binged um, t- 24, all no, those seasons. No, that was, a, yeah. And For the we, first few years, that was We stayed up good. all night as a family a couple times. Um, and you we actually did 24 and 24? That would be cool. We did. Okay. Um, and then we binged all of the alias seasons, too, as oh, a family. Oh, very good. Yeah. All right, still your move. I, I, again, I I'm watching these tactics move. just very sly. This is sort of the, this is a military strategy of some sort. I feel like tapping, tapping. All right. Well, I won't ask the next question until after you move. No, I'm worried that you're going to be successful here. Oh no, and I'm an out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm. I'm shocked. I was successful. Right, last one, and then we'll. If I don't knock it down, we'll call the interview over. <laughs> Song that when it comes on, regardless of where you are, you're gonna sing along to it. What's that guilty pleasure sort of song for you that either is from your youth or, or not? Or oh, this is so dangerous. <laughs> I, I don't have. That's that's not gonna go. You don't want me. Let's just say you well, don't I'm want not gonna me make to you sing, sing it. To I won't make you sing it. No, At least I'm, I'm gonna saying, tell you now. I'm not oh, gonna no. make you sing it. My family. This is so wrong. <laughs> I mean, well, I'm following the Moore's rule. No. I've already moved it enough, but no, you it's going to topple. No, you have to, but you're going to get it. No, not, I, don't, no, I feel not. like I'm not. No, you got it. I can see it. It's loose. Oh, <laughs> got some mad skills see, in the Z. You just wanted to ask more that questions. That was so good. Well, um, go ahead. What's that song? I, I don't know that I have one. Um, I think my favorite song... My, my, I, can I used to sing title. along at, you know, at the top of my lungs in the car when I was in high school, but it was just my my friend and I going at 4 a.m. to the swim team practice. I'm not so familiar no with this one, term, 4 a.m., I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, it was any one of Aria Speedwagon. Oh, so, that Wheels Are Turning album, yeah, I must have played that on cassette tape and, you know, indefinitely. Yeah, I played yeah. that a long so time. That would be. All right. Well, so it's now back to you. At some point, this thing is going to topple and it's going to make a big mess. But fortunately, uh, we have uh, President Designate uh, Dorina Drizzo Harris to clean it up because <laughs> that's the role of the Is of it? the person who follows you in the presidential chain. I think uh, this tapping thing is like it's very woodpeckerish. Like, is there is this <laughs> hollow? Are there insects in there? Wow, you do have some mad skills too. I am. Oh, oh, yes. come on, <laughs> come on! Oh, How man. many have we got? Oh, way too many. All right. So we've gotten 15, that's pretty good. Well, now this one is actually moving on its own, so this is easy. All right, uh, favorite place you've traveled and why? Oh, that does stink, come on. <laughs> well, I'm just gonna ask a quick question, put it right in the middle there. We've been to Thailand together. I had a great time in that Thailand. Was fun. I actually liked Cambodia better than Thailand though. Um, but my favorite place is, other than just like family vacation spots, my favorite travel place is Italy. That's, yeah, my wife would agree with uh, yeah. that. Just love Italy. Well, I think that is the end of my questions. I'm going to ask oh, you to take goodness. one more move. Now you have to take one more move just to show. And if you make this move successfully, I will call you the winner. Not just well, this will it'll end right here. It's all the it's all the marbles right here. No pressure. <laughs> this analytical eye you're taking at the tower is quite impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to. Like you can't look until you have to like tap, don't you? No. No. Not okay. Always. No. I feel like I'm getting mentorship in the way of game, which is good. I, you know, I, now that's not even a fair one to do the top. You said <laughs> that's true. I'm calling you a winner if it if it gets placed. <laughs> if I could do if it gets placed and it doesn't fall, you are the winner. Oh, colleagues, your winner, Dr. Lisa. Morris. <laughs> Lisa, thanks for joining us for uh, an Thank interview you. and a game of Jenga. Thanks for your leadership. And, and you, as I said, you earlier have been a wonderful mentor to me and so many other faculty. Oh, so thank you, thanks for your service to chess, your service to the mutual. country, and everything you've done. Hug- no, you. you're hug worthy. Thank you. I won't even. All right, I'll knock it over because it- ah, I knocked it over. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.